Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. For 12 long years, the people of Vietnam waged a grueling civil war to determine the fate of their nation, a conflict that the United States chose to intervene in. The images of Hueys flying over the jungle and Creedence Clearwater revival in the air are seared into memories the world over, along with the heartbreaking images of the suffering of the Vietnamese people. But what happened when the echoes of the choppers were gone? What happened when the napalm stopped dropping? And what happened when Vietnam was, finally and bloodily, reunified? In this video, we will examine the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play online military vehicle combat game available for PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, and previous generations. A fully cross-platform MMO, players on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation all play on the same servers, allowing for intense PvP experiences and full-scale combat missions at various difficulty settings for all playstyles and degrees of experience. Choose from War Thunder's incredible arsenal of more than 2,000 historically accurate playable tanks, aircraft, helicopters, and ships spanning over a hundred years of development from the 1920s to the present day, including the M48 Patton, the F4 Phantom II, and the iconic UH-1 Huey, all of which saw extensive use during the Vietnam War fight massive combined arms battles on over 100 battlefields from the Second World War to the end of the Cold War, and immerse yourself in the game's astonishing graphics, authentic sound effects, and music. Register and play for free using our link in the description below and join over 50 million players from all around the world on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox. Players who register will also receive a huge bonus pack with premium vehicles, premium account time, boosters, and much more. No purchase necessary. Simply use our link to register, download, and play War Thunder today. Vietnam was left with deep scars after over a decade of civil war. Scars physical, political, and in many cases, personal. Between one and three million people died in the Vietnam War and the preceding Indochina War waged by the French, the majority of which were young men, leading to a tectonic shift in the gender makeup of the Vietnamese population. Census data indicates a marriage squeeze or imbalance between single men and women as late as 1989, possibly fueled by a combination of war mortality and migration. Regardless of its gender makeup, it was the same Vietnamese population that was victimized by both sides of the war. The war crimes of Vietnam demand their own video, but include the most horrendous acts against countless civilians, as well as the theft of these same civilians' property and destruction of their homes. Much of this destruction and brutality came not at the hands of crazed soldiers, but simple chemistry. In desperation to deprive the North Vietnamese of the jungle that covered and concealed them, the United States began using a variety of defoliants that destroyed swaths of Vietnam's native plants. Though exact figures are a subject of fierce debate, it is estimated that roughly 10% of Vietnam was defoliated by Agent Orange and other chemicals. What is not debatable is the horrors this chemical warfare wrought on Vietnam's ecosystem and people, birth defects in humans and animals alike, poisons in the food chain, and disease directly linked to defoliant contamination continue to be found up to the time of writing. Civilian mistreatment did not end with the Vietnam War as many South Vietnamese citizens were sent to re-education camps by the victorious Northerners. There, they were forced to perform hard labor while in the grips of starvation and disease. 750,000 to 1 million Southern Vietnamese were simply shipped off to the wilderness, their homes and land confiscated and parceled out to loyal communists. But some Vietnamese managed to escape the horrors of peace, with 8,040 women immigrating to the United States as war brides between 1964 and 1975. 
a further 26,000 children born to American servicemen and Vietnamese women were allowed to immigrate to their father's homeland. But this was a fraction of the number born. Many were simply abandoned when it was time to head home. Colombian author and winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, did his own grim arithmetic. 360,000 people mutilated, a million widows, 500,000 prostitutes, 500,000 drug addicts, and a million tuberculosis cases, and more than a million soldiers of the old regime, impossible to rehabilitate into a new society. The communist takeover of Vietnam did not lead to a cordial block of South Asian communist states, however. Three years after reunification of their country, Vietnam invaded Cambodia and ousted the Khmer Rouge, the murderous dictatorship led by Pol Pot that killed an estimated quarter of its own people with a campaign of torture and starvation. The Vietnamese and Cambodians had long been rivals in the region. And while Vietnamese and Cambodian troops had worked in concert during the American intervention, the Khmer Rouge had long feared a united communist Vietnam would attempt to seize control over the entire Indochinese region. As the Vietnam War ended, Cambodia conducted cross-border raids, prompting Hanoi to launch an invasion. In a bitter irony, Vietnamese troops would find themselves in a quagmire of their own in Cambodia. Carlisle Thayer of the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra noted, The Vietnamese military had been trained and experienced in overthrowing an occupying power, and all of a sudden the shoe was on the other foot. They had to invade Cambodia and occupy it, and succeed in setting up a government, then engineer a withdrawal. Despite saving the country from the murderous Khmer Rouge, the Vietnamese soon found themselves the targets of Cambodian frustration, while still suffering from their own mental wounds. Win Tan Nan, a veteran of the Cambodian invasion, drew a grim parallel. American soldiers thought they helped Vietnam, then their illusion was broken. We were the same in Cambodia. But worse than being treated as an occupier by the Cambodians was the reaction of the region's most powerful player, the People's Republic of China. Pol Pot was an avid Maoist, and China had propped up his regime until the Vietnamese invasion. Chinese troops invaded Vietnam in response to their toppling of the Khmer Rouge, leading to a series of border clashes that saw 450,000 Vietnamese citizens of Chinese descent driven from their homes by their ethnic Vietnamese neighbors. But perhaps the most fascinating, if not ironic, impact of the war was economic. The economy of Vietnam was, naturally, left in utter ruin by the war. With some stability achieved by the 1980s, the Vietnamese government undertook a sweeping campaign of economic reform in 1986. Dubbed Doi Moi, it saw efforts to shift from their Comic-Con-dependent economy to a more socialist-oriented market economy, eliminating communist mainstays of price control and state monopolies. 15% of government jobs were cut, and all centralization and collectivization of industries and markets was undone. The results have been staggering. In 1990, 58% of Vietnamese people lived in poverty. By 2006, that number had dropped to 16%. Urbanization has well and truly taken root, and Vietnam has gone from a nation requiring international aid just to make it through the day, to a burgeoning market inviting international investment. When Lyndon B. Johnson escalated American involvement in the conflict, he also sought to gin up military support and build a coalition of nations to keep Vietnam from turning red. His efforts bore some fruit, as Australia, South Korea, Thailand, and New Zealand would deploy troops to the aid of the American effort. In public, leaders and presidents from Canada to Japan gave moral support to America's intervention, while privately being skeptical of the domino theory guiding American foreign policy. European heads of state in particular viewed Vietnam as a nationalist cause rather than some existential battle between communism and the rest of the world. Charles de Gaulle, president of France, often and loudly ridiculed American involvement in Vietnam as a foolish endeavor, one that, it should be noted, his country had already tried. 
After the Indochina War, French military planners had compiled a three-volume after-action report in 1955. This was valuable intelligence, real narratives about the fight America was heading into paid for in blood. So naturally, American military leaders ignored the French reports out of hand. The Pentagon was sure of American military superiority over the French Empire. Besides, this wasn't a war to hold on to some far-flung Asian colony, this was a fight for freedom and democracy, and to keep those supposed dominoes from falling. America's doggedness would prove divisive, and the knock-on effects of going into Vietnam would cast a shadow over America's international relationships. De Gaulle continued to give voice publicly to what other leaders thought privately until his time as president came to a close, and even afterward France would place itself front and center in the narrative around the war. Paris would serve as the site of the peace talks between the US and North Vietnam, and France advocated often and loudly in the halls of NATO for restraint and neutrality. As France spoke its mind, other European nations would find themselves having to give some opinion on Vietnam despite not actively participating in the conflict. The United Kingdom, a staunch American ally, was rather busy with rising tensions between India and Pakistan, the Malaysian insurgency, and Chinese threats to Hong Kong when Vietnam escalated, leading to the UK sidelining itself. In Italy, the government made abortive attempts to facilitate peace talks as the war inflamed tensions between myriad political parties. Neo-fascists, monarchists, and other conservatives were outraged at the efforts by the Christian Democrats to mend fences with Italian socialists, and this raging debate only intensified as the war dragged on. Rome feared angering the US, and between this anxiety and the mounting political discord, any attempt at peacemaking was abandoned. In the Netherlands, firebrand anti-communist and Americophile Josef Lunds advocated for military action in Vietnam, first as Dutch Foreign Secretary and later as NATO Secretary General. The neutral nation most antagonistic to the US during Vietnam was arguably Sweden, which publicly invited Americans fleeing conscription to settle there. Relations between the US and Sweden utterly broke down in 1968, when then-Education Minister Olaf Palma participated in an anti-war protest alongside the North Vietnamese ambassador to the USSR, leading to the US recalling its own ambassador to Sweden until 1970. In 1972, now Prime Minister Palma made a radio address following the American bombings of Hanoi, likening American actions to the worst atrocities committed by the Third Reich, and leading to a second breakdown in diplomacy. Sweden's opposition to the war, including sending medical supplies and doctors to train and treat North Vietnamese personnel, was framed as a protest of the United States ignoring the will of the Vietnamese people. The US remained active in world affairs after Vietnam, with VIP visits to European allies made to show continued faith in America's foreign ties. But as the US licked its wounds and learned its lessons, an idea began to form that would be cited in future crises and interventions, Vietnam Syndrome. Allegedly coined by Nixon, Vietnam Syndrome is the idea that the defeat in Vietnam so wounded the American psyche that it induced a sense of pacifism that reverberates into the present day, a wound that was self-inflicted. Alexander Haig, Secretary of State to Ronald Reagan, opined that America could have won Vietnam if it had only applied the full range of American power to bring about a successful outcome, with Reagan himself stating that the American military was denied permission to win. The Democratic Party, to whom President Kennedy and Johnson belonged, was riven by the Vietnam War, with both pro- and anti-war sentiment motivating people to disassociate. Those against the war left on principle, while other Democrats who supported Vietnam left in frustration at the perceived domination of the party by anti-war elements. Both camps would either register with the rival Republican Party or become independent voters. One of the most unpopular aspects of America's involvement was the draft, America's version of conscription. 
For most of America's history outside the World Wars, there were sufficient volunteers that the draft was not a serious consideration. But as the popularity of Vietnam and volunteer numbers both plummeted, draft calls rose. The failure of Vietnam soured Americans on the draft, and President Nixon allowed the law authorizing conscription to expire in 1973. The United States has had an all-volunteer force since, and Americans continue to resent the idea of conscription. Although American men are legally required to register for the draft, reintroducing it remains an unpopular idea, with the most recent push in the early days of the War on Terror failing despite the emotionally charged atmosphere of the time. But the impacts of Vietnam were economic as much as they were political. President Johnson refused to levy new taxes to pay for the war, sparking a cycle of inflation that damaged the American economy. Demand for resources increased as military spending rose, with 1965 seeing the use of manufacturing infrastructure reach a level unseen since the Second World War. These demands coincided with Johnson's War on Poverty initiatives and a tax cut intended to incentivize economic activity, both factors that accelerated inflation in the American economy. All told, the Vietnam War cost the United States roughly $977 billion in 2022 dollars, saddling the nation with interest payments and debt servicing for decades to come. The United States unequivocally failed to prevent communism from taking over Vietnam. But in the post-Cold War world, spurts of capitalist investment have seen the country shift into a mixed economy. Vietnam and the United States normalized diplomatic relations in 1995. And the former opponents are now much closer. The People's Republic of China continues to apply pressure to Vietnam as part of its attempts to expand its influence, despite a mixed reputation throughout the rest of Southeast Asia. Today, Vietnam finds itself needing to balance its relationships with China and the United States, as it wishes to pursue cooperation with both powers. The Vietnam of today is a nation of mixtures. The scars of the past mixed with hope for the future, and the ideas of communism mixed with the systems of capitalism. Thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. Use our link in the description below to download the game, get your exclusive bonus, and play War Thunder for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox.